This morning our keynoter is, is a guy who has spent an incredible amount of time, energy, and excitement around this thing we call planning and funding. And he's going to bring it to life in a little bit different way for you this morning. Now, a few of you may have heard Phil Madison speak uh, at the CCC a little over a year ago, so you'll be entertained again. Uh, but Phil Madison is a successful business owner. Uh, Core Products is his company based in Wisconsin, although he lives across the line here in Minnesota. So he kind of straddles the line between the two states for anyone who's concerned about uh, uh, loyalties. I haven't asked him if he's a Packer fan or a Viking fan, but I, it probably doesn't matter, does it, Phil? It doesn't matter. Um, you'll find that Phil is an airplane, airplane pilot. Um, I had an opportunity last summer, along with Steve Wilcox and John Andrews, uh, Phil flew us to the National Scout Jamboree in West Virginia in his airplane, and you'll, you'll uh, get a sense of, of that. But over 5,000 hours of experience behind the, uh, in the cockpit. Um, in addition to that, uh, he's got over 1,200 hours in a um, Super Cub. And you'll learn the significance of the time in Super Cub as you get to know a little bit more about him. He's been to the Arctic Circle four times in an airplane and taking groups with him. And that's going to be an important part of his discussion with us this morning. Uh, you can see his, uh, his flight ratings up here. But Phil is an incredible guy. One of the things that I thoroughly enjoyed this summer in the flight to the Jamboree, as you'll notice, he's got a mustache. And honest to goodness, you know, John and Steve and I are in scout uniforms. And we thought we were going to be the chick magnets on the flight, right, on the trip. So we stop and you know uh, do whatever. Every time we turn around, and it was guys and gals. I'm not being gender, gender uh, uh, biased here at all. Everybody wanted to meet Phil and know about his mustache. Um, so this morning, if you'll help me welcome Phil, and I will say one other thing as he comes to the, to the forefront, uh, I am pleased this morning to also introduce him for the first time as a member of the board of the Northern Star Council. Uh, just yesterday, he accepted a call uh, that we put out to become a board member. And uh, this morning, I had the pleasure of introducing him as a member of the board. Phil? Thank you. You'll want that. Phil, you want that? Oh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I, I, have, I have not been a Boy Scout for uh, 30 years. And when John asked me if I'd do this, and, and, and I, of course, I, I went out to breakfast with him, so I knew what we were going to be talking about. And, and actually, Steve Wilcox asked me if I was interested, and Brian reinforced it, and then I had breakfast with John. And so I pretty much knew that, that I either had to walk in the door prepared to say yes or no. And, and quite honestly, I was like, man, I had three girls. <laughs> <laughs> what do they going to say if I Boy Scout, right? So anyway... First thing I did when I got in the car is I texted all three girls and my wife and I said, I'm a Boy Scout again. And I was so excited and they texted back and, and they wanted to know, do they have cookies? <laughs> <laughs> and are you going to get some of those stupid looking shorts? <laughs> so I told them, yes, I'm not only going to get the shorts, but I want the tall, dark socks because I want to continue to be the world's most embarrassing dad. <laughs> you know, and with three girls, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. So I do have a very successful business. I started my business 25, 26 years ago now. We have 100 employees in western Wisconsin. We started in Minnesota. We are a manufacturer of orthopedic supports and soft goods, and we sell them to distributors and dealers and, and people all over the, all over the country. And we, and we do private label work. We make our orthopedic and soft goods to other people's specs and under their label. And we also do contract sewing. Well, we started our business just as all the sewing was going offshore, right? Everybody knew you couldn't run a sewing business in the United States anymore. It was all going to China. Well, we started our business, which is really didn't start as a sewing business. It started as a business to sell a product, to, to meet a need. I had hurt my neck and back, and I was a patient of a chiropractor, and he had an idea for a product, and so I started the business to meet that need. Eventually, I needed capacity, and so we learned to sew, and eventually we learned that not only could we do our products, but we could also do contract sewing. We don't do garments, we do mostly widgets of some sort, and we make a lot of components 
for other people where a sewn component might be a sub-assembly of somebody else's finished product that we have nothing to do with manufacturing. And now that we're starting to see things change a little bit and some of that kind of work come back to the US, we're getting more and more and more calls to do that kind of work. But my real interest and my real dream was to be a pilot. You know, my dad was a pilot and, and he, was a, he was a military pilot, a highly decorated military pilot. And I didn't know until many years after he was dead that what he was was a spy. He flew spy planes in World War II, in Korea, in Vietnam. He flew in the Bay of Pigs, and he, he, was a, he was a spy plane pilot. And I didn't know that. What he told us is that he flew routine weather missions. For the, <laughs> and when they got shot down, they, the newspaper said they were shot down while flying a routine weather mission in, uh, in, uh, over, uh, along the coast of Korea in Vietnam. Apparently we needed to know a lot about the weather there. So when I was a kid, and I used to doodle in school, I doodled a little bit of an airplane now and then, and of course my dad was excited to encourage me in that direction and got me into model airplanes and all that sort of thing. So as I became an adult, at some point I decided that I should become a pilot. And I actually I went to ground school the first time when I was in high school, and, and then I did it again in college, and. Finally, when we moved our business to Wisconsin, we're about a mile from the Osceola Airport, and I called the FBO there one day, the gas station, then the, the flight school, and I said, what would it cost to charter a plane from here to Milwaukee? And they said, well, sir, we don't have a charter certificate. But what we could do is we could give you a lesson to Milwaukee. And I said, now wait a minute. You're telling me that if I come over there, I can get in the plane with one of your instructors, we'll fly together, me in the left seat as the student, all the way to Milwaukee, me getting a lesson. He'll wait while I do whatever business I'm going to do in Milwaukee, and then he'll fly all the way back with me, taking another lesson all the way home. He said, yes, sir, we'd be happy to do that. I said, don't even move. I ran down the stairs to my office. It's less than two miles to the airport. And I walked back into the desk, and I said, let's go through that again. And I signed up for my first flight lesson, and I've been flying ever since. So where most pilots, if they've gained over 5,000 hours, have done it on somebody else's nickel, I've done it on my own. And the one thing I learned is you never want to do this. You never want to take your total hours, estimate the average cost per hour, and multiply it out. Don't do that. And don't do it where your wife knows what you're thinking about for sure. So. My mom, I had a terrific mom. She's gone, so is my dad, but she was terrific. And one of the things that she taught me, how many of you guys had this? How many of you in school were taught, don't daydream? Jack, were you taught don't daydream in school? Yep, so Jack's taught don't daydream. The rest of you, anybody taught don't daydream? I remember that teacher, yeah, a lot of you. I remember the teacher saying he'd be a good student if he just didn't daydream all the time. And of course, when I daydreamed, I doodled pictures of, pi of airplanes and rockets and Things like that. And then I was also taught, don't talk to strangers. In fact, there was a thing on Channel 11 the other day. They were talking about stranger danger. Don't talk to strangers. And how many of us have, learned, have taught our kids, don't talk to strangers? Anybody do that? Got them, all the moms are nodding their head. The dads are half of them asleep. Okay, there we go. And then don't run with the scissors. We told them, don't run with the scissors. Well, what, were, what are we doing? We must be out of our minds teaching our kids this stuff. This is crazy. Don't daydream. Anything in your life you ever accomplished that didn't start with a daydream? Nothing. Do you know the difference between a daydream and a goal? Hey, did you teach your kids set goals, but don't daydream? <laughs> the difference between a daydream and a goal is a date. You take a daydream, you add a date to it, it's a goal. How are you going to teach a kid? How are you going to talk to your spouse? How are you going to dream about that lake cabin or a new boat or, or, or the camp out you're going to go on here with your kid? If you don't start out by daydreaming and then eventually go plus date. A daydream plus a date is a goal. So never teach a kid don't daydream. Then we teach them don't talk to strangers. You know, from my point of view, you all are strangers. And in fact, I bet if you look around, I bet somebody sitting next to you or sitting right in front of you is a stranger. And is it possible that we really don't want you to talk to each other? 
Is it possible that the biggest breakdown we have in our entire scouting experience is horseshit communication? <laughs> so we taught our, we taught our kid, don't talk to strangers. My God, if you're going to communicate, use your thumbs. <laughs> Text. But don't talk. And then we say, we need better communication. But don't talk to strangers. There's a disconnect there if I ever heard one. Then the last one was, and I got too quick on my thumb there, is don't run with the scissors. Well, don't run with the scissors means don't take risk. It means don't take risk. But I got the opportunity to fly with these three gentlemen to the Jamboree. And I'm walking around there, hadn't been a Boy Scout for 30-something years, and I'm watching. And you know what the entire Jamboree is about? It's about teaching kids to take risk, control risks. So don't talk to strangers is stupid. Don't daydream is absolutely ridiculous. And don't take risk is the exact opposite of what we really want our kids to do and what we want ourselves to do, right? So I had a big dream. And I dreamed that, I dreamed that someday I'd, what are we doing? You're showing that crook. <laughs> I am? Thank you. <laughs> I'm falling apart here and didn't even know it. All right. So I had this dream. And my dream was to become a pilot. First it was to run a successful business and have a family and a home and this, that, and the other thing. And one day, when my wife and I got married 30-something years ago, I'm supposed to know how many, but I don't remember. 30-something years ago, when we got married, we bought a house. We bought a house on Forest Lake. It was in foreclosure. Interest rates were 11 12%. The real estate market had gone to crap. It was the worst time you could ever choose to start a business, start a family, or buy a house. And, every, and the news was full of all the same lousy media that it's full of now. And, but this guy had gone foreclosed on that house. And I was watching some of my friends daydream about having a house and a cabin. And I thought, I don't have the discipline to take care of two yards. So I dreamed about buying this house. And I found this lovely house on Forest Lake for $110,000. Only good investment I ever made in my life. Everything else I did in the stock market, right down that tubes. Anyway, that house worked out pretty good. And so we were, we were anticipating closing on that house. And we were sitting there, and, and we're fishing in front of the house. We had a boat, we're in the water, we're catching crappies in front of the house, looking at the house. Man, in three weeks, we're going to close on that house. And all of a sudden, I hear off in the distance, I hear this putt, 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 putt. And I look up, and here comes a little champ on floats. And that little champ on floats comes over the top of our boat, lands on the water, and taxis up to the shore on the north side of the lake. And I thought, that is cool. That is so cool. And I had spent all my life, this is long before I ever had, had learned about this other deal with the lessons and all that. And my wife said, there's always a bigger dream, isn't there? And I said, yes, there is. And so at that point, I dreamed of becoming a bush pilot. Because a bush pilot is way more fun than being, <laughs> than being a business guy. So my dream, truly, was to become a bush pilot. It says adventure seaplanes on the back. And I thought, man, that's what I want to be. I want to be a bush pilot. A bush pilot is a guy that flies up into the Arctic or flies up to go fishing or pulls up to his own dock in a seaplane and lands, just like the guy who had done it that flew over me that day. And, and today he's one of my best friends. I didn't even know him the day that he flew over the top of me. So learn to break the rules. When you start dreaming, dream big. This is where we're planning one of the trips to the Arctic, the first trip to the Arctic Circle that we took. And my daughter walked up and she said, wow, Dad, your dreams are too big for the table. <laughs> and you know, that's pretty cool, right? Because the kids' reality is their house, their home, and my dreams are too big for the table. So I'm asking you, what do you dream about? And what's the biggest dream that you can imagine? And once you dream that big dream, how do you learn to dream bigger? And I learned some of the keys to dreaming a bigger dream. It starts out with stimulus. Find other people to daydream with. Talk to people. Learn what they've accomplished. I got to... I, I learned the other day that, do you know what a, you know what a mentor is? You, ever, you all know what a mentor is? How many of you got perfect hindsight? Anybody here <laughs> perfect hindsight? A mentor is somebody willing to share their perfect hindsight with you. I got that off of a fortune cookie yesterday. I thought, you know, that applies to all of them. 
That makes us all perfectly prepared to be mentors, doesn't it? Because we've all had perfect hindsight, and if we share it, we're perfectly prepared to be mentors. Set your dreams, then dream a bigger dream. Find an expert that can help you, or a mentor that can help you learn to dream a bigger dream. And as you go off to do things, think about the other people that share these leadership roles with you. And if you look to the left and look to the right, you'll find there's all kinds of different leaders in the room. And I think you should be careful because you never know what the other leader might be like. And I've worked with all three of these kinds of leaders. Now I'll tell you that they all three have different qualities. The one on the left, that guy is the one that everybody likes to hang out with. He's the guy that's the life of the party. He's even got Superman capes on his socks. <laughs> Superman shorts, he's got his cocktail. The slick guy, he's the one that's gonna try and convince you where to go, but the one on the left is the one all the kids wanna follow because he's the most fun. And then of course we occasionally run into these other two leaders. And they're a little bit challenging to deal with, I'm sure you can see. You know, as we dream, and as we dream in scouting, what do scouts want to do? Scouts, scouts want to go on an adventure. I was interviewing, I've interviewed two Boy Scouts getting ready for today's conversation. One of them was a young man I talked to on the phone, one of the, a son of one of the ladies that I was visiting with. I think his name is Max. And I asked Max what it is that, that he likes in scouting. And then there's another young man here, Joe Wiltrout's son. I asked him what he likes in scouting. And, and what they like is adventure. And if you're going to go camping, you certainly want to go beyond the end of the road. And as you, as you adults start planning today, you need to think about the leadership style that you're going to share with those kids. And there's two kinds of leaders that we've learned about recently. And there are the visionary and the integrator. The visionary is the guy that can tell you about the big fish you're going to catch. He's the guy in this slide over here that's super excited when you park your airplane and right there in front of you after you've been traveling for two weeks in a two-place airplane through the, through the bush up into Alaska and the sign says, food, booze, and shelter. I keyed the mic, I said to my buddy, we're home. <laughs> food, booze, and shelter, what else do you need, right? Then you got the integrator. My buddy here, his name's Wolfgang. Wolfgang, he's the detail guy. He's the guy that's gonna help you figure out all the details that he knows the visionary is going to screw up. Because you talk him into all this, but he's the one that says, yeah, but we got to remember all this, 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 and this. And the thing is, don't let yourself get crippled by the details. Make sure you stay focused on the vision and have lots of respect for the details as you go into these things. Sometimes we can detail ourselves to the point we talk ourselves right out of doing it. Well, you know, when I was talking to Jack a few minutes ago, Right over here, raise his hand, Jack, so everybody knows you. There you go. Jack, I asked Jack, I said, the whole time you were in Cub Scouts, I said, do you remember of the things you like to do most? He said, yeah, I like the activities. And he described various activities he liked. And I said, do you remember anything going wrong? Nope, doesn't remember a thing going wrong. I bet you his dad could tell you everything went wrong on every camp out, because as adults, we were worried about all that stuff, right? He don't remember a thing going wrong. Not a single thing ever going wrong. And you know what? Your kids don't either. In fact, if you're a leader in business, the people you lead in business don't dwell on the things that went wrong. They maybe notice them at the time, but they dwell on the things that went right and the excitement that they have. So the visionary and the integrator. The visionary. The visionary is, he's, a, he's, he's got lots of ideas. He's a strategic thinker. He, he does research and development. He's great with big relationships. Might be the entrepreneurial minded person in the crowd. He drives culture, solves big problems, but not little ones. He's a guy that thinks about how to get around the big issues and the big problems. He likes to close the deal and he's emotional. He's probably ADD. And the whole time he was in school daydreaming, they told him it was a disadvantage to be ADD. Well, you, as soon as you put him in business, you need somebody ADD. Or in a, in a troop like this, you need somebody ADD because he can go from one subject to the next, to the next, to the next, and back to the first one where the linear thinker is bothered by the fact that we're changing subjects before we've completed the last one, right? So we need all these types of relationships. The visionary is not good with details. He's not good at follow through. And he's all excited by shiny objects. And he goes in another direction as soon as you show him a new shiny object or a pretty girl, right? The, the integrator, he's the one that holds the team accountable. You notice how this 
how this looks right here, this the top of the sign here where we have what in a traditional org chart would be president and vice president, meaning we have two people with the same job description conflicting over who's going to do the job. When, as soon as you change this concept to a visionary and an integrator, an integrator being the detail guy, the tiebreaker, the glue, he beats the drum, he's accountable for the results, he executes the plan, he does organizational clarity, he removes obstacles, and he operates on logic. And as soon as you allow within your groups, your individual groups, as soon as you allow respect for each of these attitudes, it's incredibly empowering. It's huge. Because the visionary, he's thinking he should be the detail guy, and he's not good at it. And the detail guy, he's thinking he should be the visionary, and he's not good at that. And so they're both conflicted by the things they can't do well. And once we learn this concept, it's enlightening. It's, in, it's, it's incredible. It, it, it just really frees you up. So one of the things I learned in Scouts 30 years ago is be prepared. Well, be prepared means what are you going to need for your trip? Are you thinking a little bit about the adversity you might run into? And here's some of the things you need for a great trip. A great trip to the Arctic requires the same thing you guys are looking for today. It requires that you develop a plan. Find some funding and communicate the plan. When I was on the phone and they were telling me about Journey to Excellence, and then they, which they re converted to an acronym, JTE, which meant that immediately I didn't know what they were talking about, right? Because as soon as we take something and put in an acronym, you know, we have a printing department at work and those girls are always talking about PMS. It amazes me how they talk about PMS. Every day they're talking about that Pantone matching system that's used for grading color. But you know, sometimes people will misunderstand an acronym. So I think what you guys are planning is a journey. And it's a journey that you and the kids are going to go on together, and it's the journey for the next year. And that, and that journey has to be a well-developed plan, funded, and properly communicated. End of story. So when he told me about 39 points last year, I went, wow, whenever I introduce 39 points at work, we always fall on our face too. What are the three most important things you can think about? The plan, the funding, and how we're going to communicate it. So the plan and when you're going to the Arctic involves fuel, involves fuel and fuel planning. Where are we going to get more fuel? How much are we going to carry? How, how, ba how bad are we going to break the rules? How heavy are we going to fly when there's not going to be any more fuel available? You were only allowed by law to fly so heavy. Well, you go in the Arctic, you might be a little heavier. If you, would you rather be overweight or have more fuel, right? You're going to need cooking supplies, bear spray, guns, bug spray, fishing, flight plan, tools, extra spark plugs. You need all kinds of stuff, whether it's on a Boy Scout trip or whether it's on a flying trip with a bunch of your flying buddies. You need all the same considerations. Then we need to learn to share the dream. <clears throat> That's what we're doing today, right? We're all here in the same room learning to share a dream. This journey that we're going to take our individual packs on. And we're going to take these individual kids on. And if we share the dream and we share it with enthusiasm, we'll have a whole bunch of more kids that want to participate. And not only that, if we learn to share our dreams in a different way than we did in 2000, because the communication methods have all changed. And judging by the hairdos in here, we're all resistant to those changes in communication methods. Because the kids are communicating in a dramatically different way than we did. Our magazines have all gotten thinner. Our, all of our methods for communicating have changed. And all of us with this hairdo, we resist this change in communication, right? We got to learn new communication styles so we can share our dream more effectively. The other thing that's important to learn anytime you're dealing with a group of people is how are we going to overcome adversity and deal with healthy tension? Healthy tension means that if you and I disagree on a topic and we have an aggressive argument, that means we've enjoyed each sharing our point of view on that topic. That doesn't mean I don't like you and you don't like me. Right? It means we have a different point of view. And I like to sell. So I want to sell you on believing my point of view. And maybe you're equally as enthusiastic, and so you want to sell me on believing your point of view. And that's an argument. An argument's not necessarily a negative thing. My God, when the kids were in debate club, they're arguing. We're training them to argue. It doesn't mean it's negative. It means that we're enjoying a healthy 
a healthy conversation, and it's okay to have healthy tension. So when you get back to your troops, and when you get back to the smaller groups that you're going to plan in, I suggest you start right out by somebody saying, let's agree to help have healthy tension and agree that that's okay. It's amazing the barriers that you'll break down. I do this at work. I say, it's okay to argue with the boss. Otherwise, I won't know your point of view. Right? Healthy tension is a good thing. Got to do it with your kids. Everybody. Jack, can you argue with your dad pretty good? Sometimes. Sometimes? <laughs> All right. Is it okay to argue with you? If you, di if you disagree with dad, is it okay to tell him your point of view? Yes. All right. That's good healthy tension, man. That's a good thing. And then we might need some timelines and some dashboards and some checklists. Let's look at, let's look at checklists for, or, or I'm sorry, key performance indicators. The 39 things that Brian was talking about were your key performance indicators. Certainly, if you're flying this airplane, I, how many of you would agree we're missing some key performance indicators? Right? So we want to know. What's our altitude? How fast are we going? How fast do we need to go in order to maintain our altitude? How much fuel do we have? And how much are we going to burn in order to get to our destination? That's no different than how much funding are we going to have to make it to the summit for the Jamboree and make it back again and not run out of cash. Are we going to have enough car? What are our key performance indicators? Same thing applies at work. In fact, th whoops. Now I did it. So this is, some of the, this is a, a dashboard we use in our once a week meeting so we can see our key performance indicators. And one of the things that we learned to do was not to read every detail, but to use the color. Okay, so in this particular period, the top half is sales. So sales were soft this week, but these other things which had to do with certain product lines and receivables and credit line, they were green. So we can bam through those key performance indicators quickly by using some color to know are we in the right, are we doing the job the way we want to or are we not this particular week? So have some methods that you can see it as a, at a glance so that you can be prepared to go through those things quickly. You know, I'm aware that in the Boy Scouts, you have manuals and manuals and manuals of procedures and how to do everything in excruciating detail. And I have the same thing in my airplane. I've got all these manuals up here. And I spend, once a year I spend in training, going through those manuals in excruciating detail. But on a day in, day out basis, every time I get in the cockpit, whether it's in my little Super Cub or in my bigger plane I use for business, I don't use those manuals. I couldn't possibly digest that much information sitting behind the controls when I'm in the air. So what do I use? I use a checklist. All those manuals boil down to this checklist. And a checklist is not a to-do list. A checklist means did I consider this and choose to do it or not? And what's the list of things that I want to consider in each of these scenarios? And if you will convert some substantial portion of the things that you do that are really important, take them from the excruciating detail and take them down to a bulleted checklist, you will not find yourself unwilling to use it. A checklist is easy to use. It's just a list. Do I want to turn the landing lights on or off? Well, if it's daytime, I probably don't need them. Leave them off, right? Do I want to turn my pedo heat, which, if I have ice, destroys my airspeed indicator, on or off? Well, if it's 75 degrees, I'm not going to get ice. Leave it off. But by golly, I want to know that's on a checklist because next time I fly, it might be cold out, right? So learn to use checklists and take your emergency procedures and build those into a checklist. That's, and then the most important thing is reinforce, did you use the checklist? And you can teach kids to use a checklist because it's quick, it's to the point, and it's relatively easy. Another thing we need to do before we take off on any trip is we need to understand the weather. And the weather comes in many forms. The weather certainly applies the way we see it on TV like this. The other way we see the weather is if we're out in the boat and the wind's blowing towards shore and the polar bear's looking for lunch, that's kind of a pretty good indication of the current weather. It's also a pretty good indication of the risk you're taking at the moment, right? If you're sitting there looking at that bear. The other in business, we check the weather by watching our economic forecasts and our economic trends. And we've got to find a way to do that without paying attention 
to the media because their goal is to sell advertising, not share accurate information. So find some way in your business or in your troop to check the weather. What's the, what's the status of everybody's attitude? What are the elements that you can correlate to the weather? And then think about decision making. You know, one of the things I teach in my business is that we should make the best decisions we can make with the information that we have at the time. If in the future the information changes, we'll make a new decision, but we won't beat up the decision maker or the previous decision because we made the best decision we could make with the information that we had at the time. Well, certainly, you'd make a different decision when you crawled out of your tent here at, at, the, at the Jamboree than what you would if you crawled out of your tent here, right? Those are entirely different decisions. But you're in the same situation. Here's the same red tents. There's the same background. Entirely sa same situation, but potentially different decisions. So as I was interviewing the kids, when I was talking to Max and to Jack, I said, what do you guys like doing most in Cub Scouts and in Boy Scouts? They said, we like activities. I said, which activities do you like best? And they described the high risk, high perceived risk, high adrenaline activities, both kids. And I went, wow. So when I'm at the Jamboree and I'm walking around there and they'd ask me to speak sometime after the Jamboree, so I'm paying way more attention to the Jamboree than I normally would because I'm looking for content, right? And I'm like, wow, these kids are throwing axes and shooting bows and arrows and learning to shoot guns. And over here they're riding skateboards on a very complex skateboard park. And somewhere else they were doing something else. They were all taking and doing, and you could tell by the way they were intense about doing it. We saw one kid, he's going around this thing on a BMX bike, and he's going so slow, it was amazing how slow he was going. But in his mind, the perceived risk was enormous. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been going that slow, right? So how do we expose our kids to activities with high perceived risk where they could potentially have a high outcome without eliminating all the risk? Because if we eliminate all the risk, We've taken the fun out of it. We've taken the adventure out of it. We've taken the daring out of it. Certainly the kid that, that, that's, that's doing this in the skateboard park and goes home with his knees cut up is gonna tell some great stories. You know, it'll probably go away by the time he gets married, but he's gonna have some great stories about these bumps and bruises, right? So that, that all builds confidence. It, it, it builds skill sets, it builds confidence, it builds leadership capacity, and it trains us to take more risk the next time because we were successful the first time. These are some pictures actually from the, from the Jamboree. This, these, these things they had out in the water for these kids to play on and jump off of. I mean, there's a kid way up here at the top of this one. He's minuscule compared to the size of that thing that he's managed to climb up. Man, that's exciting. You gotta know that the kid that did this went back and told every kid he knows how excited he was about going to the Jamboree. And if you want more kids in your troop, you'd have more kids participate in this. And you'd use this as a recruiting opportunity. So when I talked to my 11-year-old scout, Max, he told me I like doing fun activities, spending time with my friend, and getting awards. And I thought, my God, that's an entire textbook in psychology from one kid, 11 years old, in an instant. I like to do High perceived risk, high adrenaline activities is what he described. I like shooting the bows and arrows, I like shooting the guns, I like flying the model rockets, I like going on the campouts, I like being in the canoe, I like sleeping outside, I like learning to cook outside. All the stuff he told me was the high perceived risk stuff. I like doing that, I like doing it with my friends, and I like getting the awards. And so I asked him, well when you get the awards, do you stand up in front of a group to get the awards? Well yeah, you get the awards in front of the whole crowd. Well, look at what you guys are doing for me right now. Somebody perceived that I enjoy high perceived risk activities, spending time with my friends, and that I've done it well, and you asked me to speak. So you think it's scary for me to speak. I think I'm getting an award. <laughs> because you guys are recognizing me for successfully having accomplished a variety of high perceived activities and that's, that are way beyond the risk level you're willing to take, and that's why you asked me to speak. So I think I got a merit badge in aviation right here. So if we would do that in our business, if we would do this in our families, 
if we would do this in our troops, a lot of high perceived risk activities, a lot of time with the friends, give them awards and encourage them to communicate it with their friends, we'd have, we'd, we'd have lots of success. And if we encouraged them to communicate it with their friends in ways dramatically different than we communicated with our friends, they they could communicate in excruciating numbers because they have hundreds of friends they can communicate a single photo to. We didn't even have that. We don't even, most of us are afraid to do that on Facebook or on, on all these different social media things. But there's tons of opportunity here to help these kids win. These are the things they like to do. There are 50,000 kids right there in that group. And we sat right about here on the ground. And that, was, that place is spectacular. That's the one in West Virginia that we went to. 50,000 kids in that group. And they're camping, swimming, fishing, canoeing, doing archery, throwing axes, doing the BMX bikes, riding the skateboards and escape. They're all doing, and some of them, so we saw in the ambulance, some of them break a leg. It's okay. It's all right to break. When you're a kid, somebody's going to break. We don't need to be so overprotective of our kids. That's, a, that's wrong thinking. The kids don't want to be overprotected. They, and, and you know what? The one that breaks the leg, he goes home famous. <laughs> you know, I want to do that. He broke a leg? Cool. God, my mom won't even let me ride my bike without that helmet and these things on my elbows and knees. You know, I want to do that. So now we're ready. Now we're ready to take off on a new journey. We're ready to go, and I'm ready to take you with me on a quick trip to the Arctic Circle. We've done our planning. We've got our fuel and our budgeting done. We've communicated and enticed a variety of people to go with us, and we're ready to go. There we are flying over, over southern Canada right there in that picture. This fellow owns this airplane here in the United States. He's a Lufthansa pilot and lives in Munich. And he keeps an airplane here and comes here to fly it because there's much more freedom to fly general aviation airplanes here than there are there. So he owns an airplane here and comes here on his vacation to fly his airplane. I'm thinking Lufthansa pays really well. That's what I'm <laughs> And I'm selling orthopedic soft goods and supports. They don't do that, I'm telling you. And part of the fun of going on the trip is dealing with the challenges along the way. Overcoming the adversity, meeting new people, and using each activity that you do to tell the story to a group of other people. So if you'd like to go on a trip like this, you contact Adventure Seaplanes because we take people on trips like this. What are some of the adversities you might come across? Here we are, we're, we're having lunch on the shoreline. The bear comes out of the woods. When I was a Boy Scout, I learned bang the pots and pans to scare the bear away. The second time the bear's been successful in camp, the pots and pans trick don't work. <laughs> <laughs> that's only good until he's successful once. After, and if you look real carefully, that's a, that, looks, that plate of food, they had taken a picture just a moment earlier of that plate of food. It looked like a menu picture. It was the beautiful fish and the beans and, and some biscuits there that had been made in the campfire. All skills that we learned as scouts, right? Now we're employing them as adults. And that bear's enjoying it very much. And he's, he's sitting there. He, I got another picture where he's getting a drink of water because he burned his tongue. <laughs> Even fueling an airplane in the bush is a high-risk activity. You sit up on the wing, that's not so scary. It's getting back down that about scares you half to death, right? So we get up as far north as Churchill. Churchill's where the polar bears are. 100 miles south of Churchill, we get out on the coast of Hudson Bay and we fly real low up the bay and we look at the polar bears flying a little higher than the roof here. And we fly along and take pictures of the polar bears and there's hundreds of them. And they're all laying on the beach like a bunch of overweight white guys <laughs> out there on the beach. And they're just lounging because they got their winter coats on and it's summer, right? So if they get up and move and run and do anything, they're gonna overheat, bam. So they don't want to be far from the water so they can get in the water quick and cool back down. And so we, after we got to Churchill, we went on one of these buses. And the bus has these enormous tires like this. And it's a huge, tall bus. And you drive around this bus and you look for polar bears. We come back to town. And somebody gets on a cell phone and they said, oh, right outside of town and by the end of the airport, there's two polar bears laying in the rocks. And so we got out of the buses. 
We parked the bus. We got out. These guys grabbed their guns. That's being prepared, right? You don't want to get involved in an adversity with the bear, but you want to be prepared, right? So we get out. These are two of the guides. We hike down this path, and we're standing on one side of a small lake, and on the other side of the lake with a long lens, somebody took this picture of this polar bear laying there. He has to be twice the size of a cow. He's enormous. He's absolutely enormous. And so are we taking risk? Yes. Is it a high perceived risk? Yes. Is it exciting to be able to walk out there, look across the lake? And I mean, he was like, when you look across this pond, he was over there on the shoreline about that far away. And there's two of them laying there in the rocks. They looked like rocks because they were dirty. They, they'd been rolling around and they were dirty. And there's two of them, one laying here and one laying in another spot. And of course, it's hot and it's summertime out. They're not interested in getting up, moving, and running. They got their winter coats on. They're, and their winter coats are designed for seriously cold weather. So they're going to stay right there. But if they did, we had some capacity to scare them away. Talk to strangers. Here I am at the Jamboree, and everybody in the tent is a stranger to me. I don't know any of these folks. I haven't been in that environment before. So they're all strangers. And I chatted with several people and had a wonderful time doing it. Here we are in the top picture. We're in Rankin Inlet, which is well north of Churchill, the last stop for fuel before we cross the Arctic Circle. And we're in a little Inuit village cafe having, having, uh, having dinner. And we're chatting with the local people because that's how you learn about who they are and their culture. This group, this is in Baker Lake after we've crossed the Arctic Circle and we're coming back. And this is a mom. She's got five kids. And as we're taking the picture, one of the kids says, I don't want to take the picture. So one of the kids is over there playing. I don't want to be in the picture. And just like all moms, we're standing there taking the picture, and she says, it's just not right if they're not all in the picture. Well, you can't even see that they're kids. All you can see is bug hats. Can you imagine you live up there in that incredibly uncomfortable, cold environment, and the moment it gets warm, you've got to put on a bug hat? These kids are looking forward to winter coming back, right? <laughs> and those black flies, will they are vicious, and there's huge quantities of them. Run with the scissors, take risks, go on big adventures, do things that are really exciting. Here we're north of the Arctic Circle, we've pulled up along those rocks and backed our planes in, and we're fishing, and, and we're, we're staying in an abandoned camp and having a heck of a good time. And then where does the real excitement come? The real excitement comes the moment we run into some adversity. This airplane here is a 1947 PA-12, it's a Piper. When you look at this airplane, nothing's been done to it since 1947. And the guy flying it, he's not done much of this kind of flying. He's, he's running his engine way too rich. He starts it with way too much gas. He does a whole bunch of things wrong, and we can't help him because he's in the plane by himself. And when we're sitting having a beer and talking about these techniques, he's skeptical because he doesn't really know. And so he's, he's more inclined to make the mistake because he's comfortable with it. Well, he, at one point, he's carrying fuel in his floats and a lot of fuel. There's hatches in these floats. He's got a lot of fuel down in these floats in bags, big heavy bags, black water bags is what they are. They're made for the Swiss Army and they hold four and a half gallons each. And so at some point we're flying faster planes so we send him out ahead. He lands on a lake halfway between this stop and the next stop and he goes down on the floats. Now he's by himself out on this lake and it's winds blowing, it's rocking. He gets down the floats he gets his bag out, he hoists it up on the wing, and he pours the fuel from that bag into his wing. Well, we've let him have enough of a head start to where as we leapfrog over the top of him, we're going to be able to either stop or check on him along the way. So we always start the slowest ones out first. Kind of sounds like a hike, doesn't it? Start the slowest ones out in front, and as the faster ones leapfrog him, eventually everybody gets to the same destination at the same time. Well. He goes to start this airplane. It's a hot engine. He primes it. He primes it aggressively, just like it was a cold engine. He starts it, kabam! And all of a sudden, he comes on the radio just as we're coming over him, and he says, I'm at these coordinates. He says, something's terribly wrong. The engineer in the crowd goes, great. <laughs> we get to fix something. We're 900 miles north of here, right? We get to fix something. Well, what have you done? is when he made his engine too rich, he blew the exhaust pipe right off of this engine. So here, here we have a trolling spoon 
and a hose clamp. Why someone had a hose clamp in their tackle box, I have no idea. But we have a hose clamp, and we're MacGyver in this thing. Anybody old enough to remember the MacGyver? Yeah, all right. There we go. So, so we're, we make a patch, we take some wire, and we pull the exhaust up tight, and we take a Schweppes can, and we cover these primer lines, which have fuel in them, so any exhaust that leaks doesn't overheat those, 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 those lines and cause a further problem. And then when we get to the next stop, the next camp, the engineer decides that this first repair doesn't look proper at all, and we should really improve our repair with a properly labeled Canadian beer can. So that's <laughs> underneath this, because we just couldn't have anybody open that up and see that we made a repair with a Schweppes can. <laughs> so as you take off on your journey, as you dream the big dreams, set a date, then a dream becomes a goal. Look for your funding, improve your communication, focus on activities with kids that involve their friends and that they can earn awards for. Those are the three things each group needs to worry about. The adults, easy. Plan, funding, communicate. The kids, easy. High adrenaline activities with their friends and give them awards so they can brag about it and they can communicate. It's just that easy. So as you set off on your journey, I hope you enjoy the journey and that you really enjoy and, 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 and learn to live the dream. Here we are, when we get north of the Arctic Circle, there's the mouth of this river, and it's called the Back River, and it toils into the Chantry Inlet, and at that point it becomes salt water as it goes into the Arctic Ocean. And we stand there, and we cast, and we catch fish that are like this, casting a five of diamonds yellow spoon, a daredevil five of, and it don't matter what else you throw, the five of diamonds yellow spoon catches more than anything else when it's lake trout, and when, it's, and when it's Arctic char. And you stand there and catch them and that's, that's living the dream. But you know, that's not the end of the journey. Because what, if we set a big goal and we get to the Arctic Circle, the journey's not over till we get home. And so it's really, it's not the destination. It's truly the journey. So when you are on your journey to excellence, does it really matter if you ever achieve excellence? Or does it really matter that you have a fantastic journey and that you take a lot of people with you and there's more things that go wrong, the more adventure, the more adversity. And if you're really, really, really sharp leaders, stay out of the way and let the kids solve the problems instead of us jumping in and solve it for them because we're trying to build their stories to tell, not your stories to tell. So I'd like to thank you as you turn your dreams into realities and prepare for a great journey this year. Thank you very much. What a, what a way to start off a, a morning session, talking about planning and dreaming big. You know, when we set off to redesign Journey to Excellence, the journey, Phil's, by the way, convinced me to drop the JTE, but when we set off to define the Journey 2.0, it was about dreaming big. And we asked ourselves, so what is a big dream? What is a big dream for our scouting units, for our kids and Cub Scouts to dream big? And we talk about the Trail of the Eagle. But we also know that there's so much more to scouting than just becoming an Eagle Scout. And so the journey became that magical trip to elevation 12,441 feet. The summit at Baldy, at Philmont, 12,441 feet. The journey to that summit is about more than physical perseverance. It's about mental perseverance. It's about community. It's about leadership. So much of what we do in scouting is, is folded into this idea of getting more of our kids to 12,441 feet. In fact, we would even say it's our, it's our reason for existence. It's our purpose. Because we want to get more kids into that experience. And we know that if they don't start at Cub Scouts, the chances of them getting to 12,441 feet are significantly diminished. So think about, as we're working with our unit leaders, what that vision is, what that dream is, that big dream, 
Ours as commissioners, we've centered around this 12,441 feet because it is our way of saying we want to get more kids into the experience. It's our way of saying we want to get more kids into the scouting experience. So what is this thing called uh, the Journey 2.0, JTE 2.0? Now for the details, or just a little bit more of the detail. We're not going to go into depth here because we've got these breakout sessions that are going to do a great job of it. Uh, quickly, the JTE 2.0 is divided into guideposts. And guess what? They're roughly aligned with the conversation that we've already had up to this point. The JTE, the Journey Guideposts, are number one, an annual program plan and funding plan in place by August 31st. And why August 31st? Well, this journey is about a school year. It's not about a calendar year. In the past, we've asked you to line up around calendar years because, well, that's the way we measured things and somehow we decided that was the right way to do it. But we know that scouting units operate on a program year. They operate around a school year. So having that plan in place by August 31st of every year means that the unit leaders and the young people in Boy Scout troops and venture crews that are responsible for building those plans have done it by a time that they can then communicate it, which is also a part of that August 31st deadline, a communication plan. How are they going to inform Facebook, email, website, regular, uh, regular uh, announcements at unit meetings? How are they going to communicate during the course of the year the fun and excitement that they've planned for from the beginning of the year? So how do they set the vision? How do they get the, the kids and the families excited about that long-term perspective, which by the way is no longer than 12 months into next summer's uh, camping season? Uh, but how do they set the vision and how do they communicate the plan? Those are the two first guideposts of, of the Journey 2.0. The third guidepost we talked about earlier is basic training. And that is about having our, um, our, 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 our youth facing, I always use that word, but it's our direct contact leaders trained for the role that they play within our units. From den leaders to cub master to assistant scout masters to scout masters to venture crew advisors, they have to be basic trained. And our commitment as commissioners is to enthuse them enough about the program, 12,441 feet, to get them excited about becoming trained. The fourth guidepost is all about advanced training. And this one has a long-term play to it because our strategy here is at the, at the Cub Scout level, and we talked about this last year, but the strategy is at the Cub Scout level, let's capture those adults who are the best candidates for wood badge and get one of them in every pack in the council. Get a wood badge trained leader, a youth facing direct contact leader in every cub pack in the council. And imagine, number one, what that'll do for the Cub Scout pack, and three or four years later, what it'll do for the Boy Scout troop that that group moves into. It's an incredible investment in the future. And we know that the wood badge training for adults, and by the way, the other dimension of advanced training is, is in the youth uh, dimension when we get into Boy Scouts and the Venture Crews, because you'll see there that we've now in, in, we've incorporated them into the journey. We know that getting adults wood badge trained and in Boy Scouts getting young people Gray Wolf trained or Kodiak Challenge trained is transformative to a scouting experience. Not just for those people trained, but for the entire unit. So the plan is to get them to that level. Now, I'll tell you, we don't have all of that figured out yet. Just like Phil said, we're going to go to the Arctic Circle, but there's some details here that aren't yet completely nailed down. And I'll admit one of them to you this morning, and that is that we don't have the capacity in our Gray Wolf program today to accommodate the demand that we're talking about creating through this program. Ed Goff, who's currently the council training chair, is with us today. He'll be sitting in on some of the breakouts. Uh, we do have thoughts about how to, to, to figure that out, uh, to solve that problem. 
Uh, the good news is that we probably will be in a position to solve it by the summer of 2015 or closer to that. So we aren't going to promise miracles for 2014, but we believe that by 2015 we can get closer to that capacity uh, demand. Uh, in Wood Badge, we probably have the same issue, except that I will tell you in Wood Badge, we've had classes go below capacity for the last several rounds of, of Wood Badge, for the last several classes. Um, our course director for this fall is sitting right up here, John Lewis. John, stand up and, and wave to everybody. John is excited about getting a full course for the fall, 25th, fall 2014 uh, wood badge class or wood badge experience. And so we have an opportunity to enthuse the folks that we work with on a daily basis, on a monthly basis in our units to get them into John's course. Right now, John, I think, has about 14 people signed up. As we all know, it, that actually, we may not know, but the course capacity is now up to 56 participants per course. So we've got a lot of, a lot of seats left in that fall course, and we've got a winter course coming uh, in, in winter of 2015, and we've got a summer course coming in the summer of 2014, or 2015, and we'll probably have, I think, a fall course on schedule, if I remember correctly, uh, in the fall of, of um, 2015. So there will be capacity. We'll figure it out as we go, but let's not let that be a barrier to getting people enthused about getting into some of this advanced training. The final guidepost, which is the plus one, so four plus one equals five, right? So there is this plus one. The plus one is recharter on time. And that should be something that's near and dear to every one of us in this room. Let's get the paperwork done and get on to the excitement about scouting. So by November 15th of this year, those units that have that basic requirement, recharter by November 15th, have the foundation for being a gold unit in 2014. The other parts, the other building blocks of being a gold unit in 2014 are you pick three. So you saw four guideposts. As a unit, you pick which three you want to drive for in order to qualify for journey gold, journey silver, or journey bronze. One of them qualifies you for bronze. Two of, you, two of them qualify you for silver, and three of, you quali three of them qualify you for gold. 2015, that steps up a notch. We're giving you the vision. The journey vision for 2015 is that it'll take four of the guideposts to hit gold. So we're getting serious about the pressure on advanced <coughs> training. It's, it, if you look at that as sort of that, that fourth or optional one for 2014, in 2015, we really, want to put the, we really want to put the message out that we believe so strongly in advanced training that it becomes a fundamental part of our journey in 2015 in qualifying for gold. Those are the building blocks. That's the, that's the path to getting to, uh, to gold for 2014. It is a little late in the year, but I'll tell you that Based on the program, the way it's designed today, it should not be a problem for 60 to 70% of our units in this council to be at minimum bronze, if not a silver unit for 2014. Even starting with this information today, we should still be able to get the vast majority of our units to at least a bronze, if not a silver level in 2014. And I would suggest that we'll have a good number of them that'll qualify for gold in 2014. So let's get on the journey. And remember that this is about a relationship. This journey is about a relationship. In order for this to work, it requires a unit commissioner and a unit committee chair. And I just visualize that relationship. And I know that in, in our work as commissioners that we do an awful lot of, of relationship building with cub masters and scout masters. But I like to visualize an individual relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship between a unit commissioner and a unit committee chair. And inside that relationship, all of this conversation occurs. The conversation about planning and funding. The conversation about what excitement 
what opportunities there are to enthuse our families and our kids around the adventure of scouting. If we don't have someone covering a Cub Scout pack, building a relationship with that Cub Pack unit committee chair is kind of tough to do. And I know plenty of district commissioners who either themselves or an ADC within the district is saying, you know what, those six Cub Packs that don't have a, uh, a unit commissioner, I'll cover those. Well, folks, that doesn't work. It simply does not work. We can't expect a district commissioner or an assistant district commissioner who already has their hands full, we cannot expect them to cover six or seven or eight Cub Scout packs themselves. So we've got to find the talent. It's about people. It's about having the right people in the seats that touch the units that are so near and dear to us and being able to support them. So there's going to be an altar call today. And all of our district commissioners are prepped. Um, during lunch, this happens to be the, uh, the worksheet for the West Service team. But these, these boards will be in the breakout areas for your lunch sessions. And the altar call is all about Cub Scouting and how we've got unit commissioners either set to or not set to cover the Cub Scout units in each of our districts. So we're going to be asking our district commissioners, they were supposed to have been putting together a, a, a work plan, first to identify the gap, how many Cub Scout packs don't today have unit commissioners. And by the way, that definition excludes an ADC or a district commissioner. So you can't count it if a district commissioner or an ADC has got the bases, quote, covered, because practically speaking, they don't. So on here, we'll ask in the altar call for a, a confession. What's the gap? And what's my reconciliation plan? How am I going to fill that gap over the next three or four months? So it has a monthly dimension to it. And in each of the columns, we'll total it up. And by the end of the day today, we'll have a commitment made by each of our districts for filling the gap that we have in covering our, our, our cub packs. It's simple. We can't go into the fall and expect to make a material difference in the delivery of program and the recruitment of young people and families into this without the critical boots on the street, relationship building capacity that's inherent in a unit commissioner, unit committee chair relationship and we got to build them one-on-one. -on -one. So look for these things to appear in a lunch breakout near you. Um, and the other component of this is this is about continuous improvement. To get us to where we are today has taken an, the energy of a lot of people. We've tapped into resources, the volunteer and staff resources around this council over the last six months. We started it a year ago, but we got intense about six months ago. We've tapped into the volunteer and staff resources around this council. And the overriding principle, and this is where we want you to keep us honest, the overriding principle in this process was to keep it simple. Was to keep it simple. Eliminate the paperwork, eliminate the, the scorecarding and record keeping, eliminate the debates over whether the leadership training numbers and scout net are correct or not. Eliminate all of that and get down to how it's as simple as possible. The record keeping for Journey 2.0 is a pen and a piece of paper. It's that simple, and it's, it's used inside the relationship that our unit commissioners build with our unit committee chairs around the council. This is the conversation piece. This is as simple as we want it. So keep us honest and make sure that we are keeping it simple. We'll listen today, and there, I'm sure there'll be good feedback that'll help us mold and evolve this under a continuous improvement uh, uh, philosophy. The program planning guide, there's an excerpt included in your packet that was at your seat this morning. The program planning guide has been revamped, uh, and it will be launched at University of Scouting next weekend. So the printed final version will be at University of Scouting for a handout to all of uh, the unit volunteers that, that, that are at uh, University of Scouting. Patrick Murphy, uh, Patrick is standing up in the back. Wave to us back there, Patrick. Uh, Patrick Chair, District Commissioner for Metro Lakes. Patrick chaired the task force that tackled program planning tools. 
And it's more than a program guide that you have in front of you. In fact, the toolkit's going web-based this time around. And you'll see plastered inside that booklet that you have printouts up for. You'll see on the card that I believe, the wallet card everybody's already received. Is that already in your hands? There's a wallet card. It's the wallet card version of the Journey 2.0. So you'll see in the lower left-hand corner of the My Northern Star Council, My Northern Star Commissioner Commitment, the web address that you'll find the Journey to Excellence Program Support Toolkit available. Now that, I will tell you, if you, if you go to your, your uh, smartphone right now, that website is not active. <clears throat> Clint and Dara, Patrick Murphy, and the team have been working feverishly over the last two weeks to get this thing ready. You will see in one of your breakouts this morning, though, screenshots from the website, and it will go live between now and next Saturday. We know that when we put 12,000 of these in the hands of unit leaders, we're going to get a lot of traffic. So that website will be live before next Saturday. Is it going to be perfect? Please don't expect perfection the first time out the gate. This is version 1.0 of our web-based planning tools. And we'll get better at that with your feedback and the feedback from unit leaders at, use, at, at, at building the tools and making them more and more useful. So that's, that's part number one. Uh, Patrick and, and his task force have been hard at work. And you'll see the product of that labor embedded in so many parts of what we have here this morning. Commissioner training and recognition. The other part of it, this that we realized is that we probably have shortchanged the linkage between the training program for commissioners, basic training, summit training, and College of Commissioner Science, which has been missing from the, the schedule now for, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years. <clears throat> All of those are under consideration and consideration for revamping and redeployment under the leadership of Joe Glinsky. Joe, just wave up back there if you would. Joe, uh, retired district commissioner for Northern, uh, North Star District uh, and so many other great things in scouting. But Joe has undertaken an 18-month mission to help us look at everything we do in training commissioners so that we are increasingly lining the training up with the delivery of Journey 2.0. So basic training, even the, that you'll see at University of Scouting next week, uh, hasn't been touched, but will be rather significantly revamped, probably going into the fall. Commissioner Summit next year will also be guided by the feedback and experience of that task force. And in 2015, we will reemerge with the College of Commissioner Science. So we will have an opportunity inside 2015 to move back into that program and support our commissioner core at a level that's required in order to be successful delivering the journey, delivering the vision. So look for those things at a, um, um, a website or at a meeting near you in the near future. At lunch today, um, at lunch today, the assignment, and, and by the way, this information is on a handout you can pick up again when you go through the lunch line. But the lunch, this, the lunch assignment is that you will eat and work as a district team. Uh, we'll make the, the uh, breakout rooms that you'll be in for the next sessions available for you to go back to with your lunch. Um, the Westfield team will be in here, the North and South and, and uh, special program scout reach teams will be in each one each of the three breakout rooms and we'll give you guidance to get to those at that time. <laughs> the district commissioners will have access to these altar call worksheets, um, but the purpose of lunch is, is to ask you as a district commissioner team, the district commissioner and the ADCs and UCs that are here, to build an implementation plan, a deployment plan within your district around the journey, around Journey 2.0, and to develop a plan to inform and train those who couldn't be here this morning. We've got about 175 people physically here in the room today. We've got about 386 registered commissioners in the council. So we're reaching roughly 40, 45% of our total audience. But we've got a lot of other people in this family 
who need to know the story, who need to understand what the journey's about and how to deliver the journey. So we need you to think through with us how we can help you get that information to them. Do remember that the sessions today are being recorded, so they will be available as a part of that. But we also have to make sure it connects to the people who missed today's, today's experience. Um, so it's those two parts for lunch today. So it's now time to bring it to life. Um, our breakout sessions, and I know we're running a behind schedule, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll adjust plan for the morning. Um, our breakout sessions, first of all, you're designated according to the name badge you picked up when you came in. And this is a trivia quiz. So the three names up there, Peter Bomas, Daniel Carter Beard, and William Verbeck, what do they all have in common and what's their significance to scouting? What's that? The answer's on the back. Oh, the answer's on the back? Yeah. Darn, I hate it when that happens. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Elaine did some wonderful, Elaine Sneed, stand up and, and take a bow. Elaine did some wonderful research for us and gave this, <laughs> gave us a great way to break ourselves up today. Elaine, by the way, is the one who put a lot of the materials together. So as you see her during the rest of the morning, thank her immensely for her work in, in supporting this event today. But Peter Bomas, Daniel Carter Beard, and William Verbeck were the, the first three National Council Commissioners in the Boy Scouts of America. And on your name badge is one of their names. Your breakout will be, will, will that, that name will designate you into which breakout you go to as you leave here. So look for the names on the, uh, the doors outside the breakout rooms. Um, the programs that we have, and, and by the way, these things are not going to happen in a certain order for everybody. So some of you are going to go to Maggie Knutson's session on building unit relationships before you get JTE nuts and bolts or the toolkit, and vice versa. Can't solve that unless we say put everybody in a big room and do it all together, and it just doesn't work well that way. So you'll break up into rooms, and then you'll rotate in 45-minute segments. Um, so Dan Omke and Patrick Murphy uh, will be running this JTE 2.0 Nuts and Bolts session in room 116. So if you're uh, a Peter Bomas National Council Commissioner name tag, you go into room 116. Uh, if, you, if you're um, uh, Daniel Carter Beard, you go into room 115 with Eric Sitt. Uh, I believe that's right, isn't it, Eric? You're in 115? Is that right? Okay. Eric's going to be in 115. Uh, and um, um, that's about the toolkit, the tools that have been built to support uh, the Journey 2.0. And then Maggie, of course, is in uh, uh, room 117, unit relationships. Those sessions also are being recorded. So remember uh, to, to speak up when you're talking or asking questions so that uh, everybody can hear. And remember, it's about more, more kids, more more energy towards 12,441 feet. Regardless of what that summit is in the minds of you or the kids, it's all packed into this 12,441 feet because frankly, we can see that summit. We can see a picture of that peak at, at, at Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico. We can see a picture of Baldy Mountain. And if nothing else, it's an inspiration. It's an inspiration to get kids on the journey on the path to 12,441 feet. Taking risks, having fun, learning how to be kids, but more important, learning how to be leaders for the future. So thank you for your attention this morning.